Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. The edition is whatever day it's date it is. Today's the 11th, isn't it? Yeah, all right, good. April 11th edition, Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Welcome, folks. Today we have a controversial topic, but that's okay. The forum seldom shies away from controversial topics. And we actually believe strongly that there are at least two sides to every story. Granted, when you bring lawyers in, there's usually more than two sides to every story, but today we're not discussing legal matters. Folks, we, about a month ago, took a look at the issue of gun violence from one point of view. Today, in just a few minutes, we'll be taking a look at gun violence from a different point of view. Folks, one of the things that's been going on as we've been growing in our membership, which is a good thing, we've had a lot of people asking questions and asking follow-up questions that aren't necessarily following up the questions that they had asked. They're kind of new. So we're going to try pretty hard, starting today, to have people ask their questions, try and keep it in the form of a question. This isn't Jeopardy, but you are asking a question. So keeping it in the form of a question, keeping it less than 30 seconds, and giving our speaker, speakers over time, the freedom and space to answer it. And then if you want to ask another question or something comes to you, you're more than welcome to ask more than one question. Just please go to the back of the line so that everybody gets their fair shot. That's everybody who is indeed a paid up member of the forum because that's the privilege of membership, folks. For those of you that are here with out indications on your, on your badge that you are members. In other words, if you've written in red, thank you for your honesty, but you can't ask a question unless today you find our executive director who is right over there and you give him lots and lots of money and he'll give you a membership and then you can ask questions. Actually, our fee is $50 for a year's membership, but Eric seems to want lots and lots and lots of money, but we'll accept 50. Ladies and gentlemen, Today we're fortunate to have Kevin Starn, Star, pardon me, Starrett, from OregonFirearms.com. Is that correct? Nope. Oregon Firearms Federation, the website is OregonFirearms.org. OregonFirearms.org, pardon me, and Oregon Firearms Federation. Thank you. Please excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, without further comment from me, Kevin Starrett. Thank you. I'm glad I'm making comments and not asking questions, so I want to um, appreciate the invitation out here. This is not my first time here. I've uh, been here before, and uh, I doubt we're going to top the last performance because one of the first questions I got was, uh, had I seen a psychiatrist uh, that I was mentally ill? And then the uh, person who asked the question or the accusation stormed out of the room um, yelling obscenities at a couple of reporters who followed him. It became quite the YouTube sensation. I, I doubt we're going to uh, do any better than that. This is obviously a contentious issue, and I do not have any intention of trying to change anyone's mind on their feelings about uh, gun control or gun ownership today. But what I do want to do is try and bring some honesty to this debate. and. I believe that there's a lot of that is seriously lacking. And if you want to, if your position is that a person should not own a gun, you choose not to, you don't think other people to, d should, I think that is your, you're entitled to that position. We'll have that debate for a long time. But I think it's important that when we do have this debate, we tell the truth. And the truth has been sorely lacking in this issue. Um, much is made by the other side about wanting to have a reasonable conversation about common sense gun laws, but unfortunately, I don't think that there is a lot of reasonable conversations that can ha you can have with people who rely on an awful lot of falsehoods to present their case. I think you can start with the, the, the assertion that we're suffering from a gun violence epidemic. Any violence is bad. I don't think it has to be perpetrated with a gun. When people hurt each other, that's bad. And people using guns to hurt other people, there's no question. We have no argument that's bad. But the fact is, the reality is, is that gun-related crime and uh, violence has been steadily dropping in this country for about 15 years. And so if we have an epidemic, it must have started at a much bigger epidemic. And the fact is, with the exception of some high profile and very horrifying cases, the fact is is that we really are seeing a steady drop in gun violence. But you can't really make a case unless you can create some kind of panic and some kind of fear. Gun violence is a problem in this country that is really largely confined 
to certain places. You know, I uh, recently had a meeting with a number of uh, Chinese mainland uh, uh, researchers who were traveling around the country talking to people who lobbied for different issues. And they came and met me at my gun club in Canby. And one of the questions they had, they were really trying, they're struggling with the idea that we had a club that on n days when we had hunter safety training or a youth shotgun league, how we would have hundreds of young people walking around with guns and no one was getting hurt. This was a, a, a concept they were really struggling with. And what I tried to explain to them is that it, the quote gun culture is not a monolithic thing. The gun, the problems we have with gun violence are largely, largely limited to certain big cities, typically controlled by Democrats. You know, New Orleans and Chicago have some of the highest gun violence rates. They're also the places with the most gun control. But the fact is, is that, is that we've had, we've had um, a, a suggestion that. What we want to get in terms of gun laws are just reasonable common sense measures. And the fact is, is if you look at the history of the gun control movement, what it is about and what it has always been about is the complete elimination of private ownership of firearms. And the person who started handgun, handgun, uh, the uh, National Coalition to Ban Handguns, which became the Brady Campaign, said, Pete Shields said, we want to ban all guns all the time. Dianne Feinstein, uh, senator from California, said, if she had the power, she would say to all Americans, just turn them in. So it's clear what the ultimate goal is. But I want to tell you a little bit about some of the bills that we faced and what they really did. You had a representative of an anti-gun organization here in February, and I believe you were misled to a, to a large extent. This past session, there were two major anti-gun bills that fortunately we managed to defeat them both. Let me tell you what the first one did. Senate Bill 1551. What this bill did is it allowed people who had no credentials in mental health, some of whom may not have ever even have met you, to make an anonymous accusation to the Oregon State Police that you are suffering from a mental health crisis, at which point your right to buy a firearm would be taken away. But you weren't told that this had been done to you. You were not allowed to know who made the accusation. There was, no, there was absolutely no attempt to ever determine if the accusation was true. And the accusation could be repeated. You, you were not allowed to know how long this hold on your rights was in effect. And the accusation could be repeated forever. So this accusation that was made against you was entirely anonymous and you had no recourse. And until you tried to actually purchase a gun, you wouldn't even know. But if you did, you'd get to a store, you'd be denied, you wouldn't know why, a state trooper would come out and tell you that you were suffering from a mental health crisis. Now, let's look at the ramifications of this, okay? A person who doesn't know you can make this accusation. For example, a medical professional can say, I believe that this person's suffering from a mental health crisis, even though they, didn't, they had never met you. If a person who was a medical professional, who, say, was an Oregon senator, who happened to be very anti-gun, who happens to also admit to having severe mental health issues herself, this is not hypothetical, we have this in our state, decided to make an accusation against somebody who came to testify at a hearing, that person's rights would be taken away and they would never be told about it and wouldn't know about it until they attempted to make a purchase. Now, let's have a hypothetical situation here, all right? What happens to a person who has a, uh, let's say a woman who has a really dangerous spouse from whom she's separated. This spouse can threaten her, scare, scare her, put her in fear for the, her safety of her, her life and her children's lives, and then make a phone call to the police, say she's having a mental health crisis, and now her ability to protect herself against a violent man is taken away. And she has no recourse. She's not even allowed to know what happened until she's made, attempted to protect herself. And that's the kind of thing that we were facing here. Um, it, I believe that, it, oh, the other thing that's interesting is, is that it's two, two points about this bill. There was, the bill was sold as a way to deal with mental health issues. But one, the person making the accusation didn't have to know anything about mental health. All right. The other things are is that there was never any requirement that the accusation be proven true. There was no, there was no requirement that it be investigated in any way. Okay. Didn't have to be proven true. And um, oh, 
if, if the person who, about whom this accusation was made, there was nothing in the bill that addressed actually getting this person any kind of help. So if, in fact, a person genuinely was existing some kind of mental health crisis, nothing was done to help this person. And so clearly the intent of this wasn't to provide any protection for anybody. It was just intended to provide roadblocks for firearms ownership. I don't think that that is a reasonable, common sense way to do things. I don't think that's the way we do. This is a kind of a Soviet-style way to go about things. The second bill that we dealt with was House Bill 4147. And this was the bill that you, if you were here when the gun control representative was here, he told you about this bill. And this bill was intended to close the so-called Charleston loophole. Seems like every articulated right that has to do with firearms is now a loophole. But the whole, the whole premise of this, this law was false. The claim was, was that the person who shot up the church in South, uh, South Carolina was able to get his gun because of a loophole in the law. Now let me explain to you briefly how our law works. When you try to purchase a firearm, you're required to have a background check conducted by the Oregon State Police. Now, I will tell you from personal experience, the Oregon State Police do a really, really bad job of this, all right? Their delays and denials are constant and rarely justified. Both federal law and Oregon law have a provision that say, if the background check is not completed in a certain amount of time, the person, if they haven't been denied, the person has the lawful authority to take possession of the firearm. Now, it's important to understand that when people buy guns from gun dealers, this almost never happens. Most gun dealers simply will not transfer a gun without an approval, although it's entirely legal for them to do so. What House Bill 41, uh, 4147 would have done, would it, would have, it would have created a situation where the state police could take as long as they want and you had no safeguards built in. So if the state police did what they typically do, which is a really terrible job, there was, there was no time period at which you could eventually have your rights restored. They could take as long as they want. And I can tell you from the phone calls that I get all the time that there are a lot of people who have absolutely nothing in their backgrounds that are delayed. There are some people who have been delayed for two years. The only way that you can get the state police to actually act on this is if a friendly legislator calls them and then the thing seems to be resolved immediately, which indicates to me that there was nothing there to begin with. But give you a perfect example of how badly this system works. Gun club that I, I belong to has a federal firearms license, which means that we can sell firearms to people, typically only our members. Last November, one of our members ordered a pistol. When he ordered the pistol, eventually came in, the background check was conducted, and he was placed on a delay. So because he's a member of our club, because we knew him, because we knew that the delay was unjustified, the gun was transferred. When he took possession of the gun, he said, this is not what I ordered. So he returned the gun. They ordered the correct gun, which came in in January. In January, they had to conduct a background check for the new gun. When they conducted the background check for the new gun, his status for the first gun was still pending. He'd still, he was still being delayed several months later. But the background check they conducted for the second gun was passed immediately. Right? This happens all the time, where people will pass a background check one day, be delayed or denied the next day, or vice versa. So the system just simply doesn't work. But as far as the loophole is concerned, we've been told that the person got this gun because of the loophole that allowed him to take possession of it without police approval. And the fact is, that's simply not true. The fact is, is that it wasn't a matter of lost records. It wasn't a matter of missing records. It was a matter of massive human failure of departments that simply didn't talk to each other, that didn't share information, and didn't tell the, the, the agency that was conducting the background check about this person's previous arrests. So no matter what would have happened, even in the case, had, had this law been in effect, nothing would have changed. But it's kind of interesting that we uh, constantly deal with the, the promoters of gun control who promote it as a way to, to uh, protect people from domestic violence. But in this particular piece of legislation, uh, but by the way, I should point out that the, the proponent of this legislation, Jennifer Williamson, came, who came and testified on behalf of the bill, said that 95% of people who are delayed are delayed with no justification. She said that herself. As a, I don't know why she, I mean, it seemed kind of odd for her to point that out since it completely undermined her bill. But while the bill was being debated, 
a Republican legislator, and remember we're talking about a, a constant emphasis on, on avoiding domestic violence, a Republican legislator offered an amendment to the bill which said the following. If a person has been delayed, and now under this bill, the original version would have made it indefinite. The bit that was narrowed down to a 10-day delay. If a person could demonstrate that they were in fear of their life because they were victims of domestic violence and had, say, a restraining order or some other indication that this, this fear was real, that there would be an exemption for them. Every single Democrat on the committee voted no. Every single Democrat voted against providing protections for people who are victims of, of domestic violence. The previous year, there was a bill that did pass. This was Senate Bill 525, and this bill was totally about domestic violence, and it was about taking guns away from people who were supposedly domestic violence abusers. Now, first of all, let's put aside the fact that everything in the bill was already law, right? And really, nothing in the bill created any, any real added protections for people who are victims of domestic violence. We had an unusually large number of people who came and testified in favor of this bill, and they included legislators, lawyers, advocates for women's organizations, district attorneys, judges, and members of the Portland City Council, police officers, and they all came with the exact same story. This is just, I think, kind of highlights what, what we're up against in terms of the, the kind of deception that we deal with in this issue. Every single one of them claimed that this bill was necessary because although all of these restrictions were already in place as part of federal law, and these added no new restrictions, that Portland police or Oregon police are not allowed to enforce federal law. And they said this repeatedly and they said it and dozens of them said it. In many cases their talking points were word for word the same. The fact is, is that's simply not true. Oregon police most certainly can enforce federal law. And not only is that in our statutes, but that is in a recent Supreme Court decision that oddly enough did deal with firearms, it deal with concealed handgun licenses and medical marijuana cards. But even though we pointed this out time and time again that the people who were promoting this bill were lying about the need for it, it was still, it, the, the lies continued. There was probably no need for it, but this is what we face. You might remember last year we had Senate Bill 941, which was the bill that mandated background checks for all transfers. Now that might sound like a really good idea, except what it also did is it created a situation where it is now illegal if a person, say, is going out of town to allow his neighbor who has a gun safe to safeguard his guns while he's gone. If you have a person, a friend, a relative, somebody who has a, some kind of personal issue which, which strongly advises them not to have a gun in their house, either somebody's coming to stay with them who's not stable or they themselves are experiencing a situation where they prefer not to have a gun around, it is now illegal to safeguard a gun for that person. I don't really see why at a time when we're doing, you know, we want so much to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them or keep guns out of the hands of children, why we make it impossible for a responsible person to safeguard a firearm for another person who's in need at the time. That bill was promoted as being supported by, depending on which day it was, it started that 80% of, of all Oregonians supported it then 85, then the last stats I saw were 87 until a recent Brady campaign email that said over 90% of people supported this. Now, I don't know in your experience how often you have gotten 90% of people to agree on anything, but I will say that out of the 36 counties in this state, 24 counties wrote resolutions or ordinances opposing the bill. Now, that doesn't sound to me like 87% of the people supported it. Dozens of sheriffs said they simply wouldn't enforce it. These people are all elected officials. And yet, the deception continues. Um, we, have a, uh, uh, we had a bill not long ago, when one of the complaints of, of anti-gun lobbies are that gun owners don't have sufficient training and they are not competent to have guns. Yet when we had a bill that would have expanded the number of locations where firearms training facilities could go, they lobbied heavily against that. Every time we've attempted to have legislation that would provide gun safety training for school children, they fought us on it. This does not impress me of people who are really interested in solving the problem. Ultimately, what I'd like to say in closing with this is that there, there can be legitimate debates about this issue. It's quite clear which side I am on. 
but we're not going to solve the issue until we become a little bit more honest about the positions we take and can actually back up the assertions that we're making. What it, do what it does when we do that is simply eliminate the possibility that we can actually start solving other problems. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Did you want to get up? Yeah, it's over just for a sec. Thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate your statements and your point of view. And I believe we're starting to line up with questions right now, uh, running into monitors and having fun as we line up. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, again a reminder, you need to be a paid up member of the forum and I look forward to the questions. I will stay up here today and monitor just a little bit because we're going to be a little bit more rigid with our rules. So if, with that, first questioner please. John Blackman, forum member. Thank you so much for coming. Will you mind sharing with us the first four words of the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States and your reaction to them? Uh, a well-regulated militia being. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, my reaction to them, uh, I, I'd like to prefer to, to, to look at the amendment in its entirety. I know that at the time the amendment was written, regulated, had a specific meaning, meant meaning well-trained. I support training. I've been a firearms instructor for 30 years, and um, I think that it's clear that, that, that the, uh, the Second Amendment was, was written with the understanding that we are all, or at the time, all able-bodied males were considered to be part of the collective force that protected both the nation and their neighborhoods. Thank you. Hello, Elizabeth Furs, and I'm a, a member. Um, I, you've talked a lot about lobbying, and uh, I would like to ask you if you have any idea what it's like to be lobbied by a pro-gun group. Um, when the assault weapon ban came before the Congress, I was, uh, every day I got a, for two weeks, got a fax with a picture of a target and my face in the middle. I had to get a psychiatrist in to help my staff, and uh, the uh, chief of police of Portland said, asked me not to have any public meetings, that he could not protect me. That is one of the problems for elected officials, is that the lobbying of the pro-gun groups gets out of hand. I don't know if you know if that's how your national groups do it, but that's how it was done to me in 1993. So is the question, do I know what it's like to be lobbied by a pro-gun group? Yes. Well, I am a pro-gun group, so typically I am not lobbied. I do know elected officials accept a certain responsibility for the positions they take. I know when a militant anti-gun legislator takes a position that they want to eliminate the rights, the God-given constitutionally guaranteed rights that Americans have that they are going to incite a certain passionate response. I can assure you that there is no national or local organization that would encourage or condone making threats. Certainly mine doesn't. Uh, the organization that I worked for nationally before I started off, the Gun Owners of America doesn't. And so in any endeavor where you have um, strong feelings, there are gonna be those kind of reactions. And the fact is is that the positions that you took were the positions to take away the rights of people to have something they had every right to have. And when you do that, just as if you took the position that um, certain members of our society shouldn't be allowed to get married, or certain members of our society should not be allowed to engage in the religious practices they want to engage in because you prefer that, that some special group have special rights, you're going, to in, in, you're going to get some very passionate responses. And I can also assure you that the people who stand for pro-gun liberties face it, equally abusive treatment on the part of the people who support you. I'm Bill, I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, Tommy Smothers' solution to this whole thing was to take away all the bullets. So uh, the question I'm going to ask you centers around uh, the amount of weapon, rounds and clips. You know, I was in the Army. I'm retired from the Army. I dealt with weapons most of my life. I own a couple weapons even now. I, for the life of me, can't understand why anyone needs a clip with more than 10 rounds in it. But yet the gun lobby just fights like hell against it. That's crazy. Could you talk about that? 
Well, I don't think there was actually a question there, but I'm more than happy to respond to it. Your position is, is that there is a legitimate number of bullets that a person should be allowed to have. And I can't make any rational sense out of that because that assumes that you have determined beforehand every conceivable situation that a person might face, that he might face one assailant who is armed with simply a club, when in fact in many cases, which we have seen quite a bit of, I mean, if you were in uh, New Orleans during the Katrina hurricane, you saw how quickly things dissolved there. I've seen quite a few situations where there's a situation a couple of years ago with a, a, a gentleman who worked in a coffee shop, I believe it was in Eugene, and somebody came in to rob him and opened fire, and he returned fire, and when he moved outside, there was a second assailant there, and they were both shooting at him. Now, given how these things take place, how you can take the position that you can guarantee that a person can defend himself with this amount of, uh, this amount of cartridges completely escapes me. I simply don't understand how you have the, the foresight and the insight to know that this is how many I need when you have no idea what kind of circumstance I might find myself in where somebody might have to protect themselves. And this happens probably more often than we'd like. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Tim Hutchinson, former member. Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, the thing that's always bothered me about this gun uh, situation is that um, you know, I'm not as concerned about the people who actually know how to use them as the people that have guns and may not know how to use them, store them, you know, kids getting into them, that sort of thing. And so what I wondered is how, what's your feeling about how we can, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word regulate because I, I don't want to startle you, but, you know, uh, certify that people who have guns uh, actually know how to use them. Like, for instance, with the cars, you know, you have to get a license, you know, and that shows that you know how to do, drive a car. So what do you, how, how would you propose that we make sure that people who buy guns, even though they may be totally, absolutely sane and nothing's wrong with them, uh, how do we make sure that they can, they know how to use this? It's a, lethal wep weapon? Well, that's a great question. And for, first of all, um, let me say that as I mentioned earlier, I've been a firearms instructor for over 30 years. I promote firearms instruction. I have funded firearms training classes for victims of domestic violence across the state. We have made many efforts to have firearm safety training introduced into schools, which have been fought by the anti-gun lobby. But let me address your point about cars and guns and driver's licenses. And Earlier today, I had, a, I had a meeting with a candidate who's running for a house seat, and on, on way back to my office, I had, I had somebody else with me, I was driving down a street in Canby, and one of your licensed drivers came across the road and almost T-boned us both because he was texting while he was driving. The licensing of car drivers has not kept us safe from the dangers of people in cars. Uh, the fact is, is that it's a matter of judgment. And I would submit to you that in spite of what you were told by the representative of the anti-gun group, it's still more dangerous, you still face more danger from a car accident than you do from, from firearms violence. So what I would suggest we do is instead of promoting fear, which is what I can quite confidently tell you the other side does, is that we start promoting education. You know, there's a lot of things that are taught in schools that I wouldn't necessarily agree, agree with. But we said we had to do this. You know, we decided we had to teach young people about birth control and about STDs. Whether you agree with that or not, instead of saying we're going to pretend it doesn't exist, we started creating some education. And this one issue, the same people who are complaining that too many uneducated people have guns and that children are getting hold of guns do everything they can to prevent us from expanding education. And what they want to do is mandate that we lock everything up, that if you have a minor in your house, everything has to be locked up. Well. My son was a nationally certified firearms instructor when he was 14. Should I be locking guns up from him? No, I've got to make that decision based on the, all of the circumstances. So what I would say is that you and I would probably agree that these things exist. They're not going away. They're not going to go away anytime in our forever, because even in places where they're completely banned, there's plenty of them there. And so why not stop teaching fear and start teaching responsibility? Hi, I'm Spencer Ehrman, uh, member of the forum. You had mentioned the issue to be discussed 
uh, you mentioned the word issue. Or uh, I, what, my, my question is, what is the issue to be discussed, in your opinion? What are the, qu what are the questions that are outstanding that should be debated? You, you, you referenced the other side um, uh, being dishonest in, in their presentations. I, I don't know about that, but I'm curious as to what question or issue should be, should we, the, the, should be debated or should be discussed. What, what, what is that? Great question. I think the question is, do we as humans, do we as Americans, do we as Oregonians, have a fundamental right to protect ourselves and the people we care about? That's the argument to me. In response to my question, I believe you stated that in 1779, every adult male was a, automatically a militia member. Would you share with us who today is in the militia and who is not? The definition hasn't changed. I never mentioned a date. I don't say anything about 1779, but the, uh, the definition is still able-bodied males who are capable. I mean, I think believe at the time it was between 16 and 50 or something. But now there's still that, that definition has gone unchanged. Obviously, now that we have big standing armies, something our founders warned us against, it is not as common, but the fact is is that our situation as, as Americans is changing. And whether you like it or not, because of, because of events worldwide, you now very well could become a combatant, whether you choose to or not. And I point you to San Bernardino, where Islamic terrorists murdered a lot of people in a place where those people were by and large forbidden from protecting themselves. That is not going to stop anytime soon. They promised us that. And so to take the position that we as Americans should be less prepared to respond to the kind of outside forces that are coming and are here, I think is, is the wrong approach. And in fact, you may, you may not choose to be part of the militia, but you may very well become one of the victims. Hello, my name's uh, General Holcomb, member. And I'd like to know, um, in terms of a lot of people argue about criminals and people getting their hands on guns, and that's why we need gun control. What are your views and how do you look at con uh, controlling those kind of things without discriminating against other different people? How can we have sensible gun control without discriminating against other people? Sure. Well, <laughs> you, you know, I, I think a lot of people look at stories they hear, and some of you may have actually had experiences, personal experience with violence or crime. Maybe some of you even had experience with crime involving firearms. But we look at this problem and we say, well, we've got to do something. But then too often what we say is, well, this is something, therefore we have to do it, whether it makes sense or not. The fact is, is that the same people who are promoting the idea that we've got to have all these rules, when you examine what they actually have done, I'll give you a perfect example, all right? Oregon, now you have to have a background check to get a gun from somebody you've known for 30 years. Those background checks have to be conducted by gun dealers. Used to be last year, if I wanted to do a background check on someone I was transferring a gun to, I could do it myself. I could call up the state police. They give me a yes, no, maybe. They've taken that away and forced people to spend more money, in some cases, depending on when they live, travel many, many miles to go to a dealer who may or may not even choose to do the background check. But what happens when those background checks are conducted? And you don't have to take my word for this. What I'm going to tell you is available every month on the Oregon State Police website, and the statistics go back many months. They are showing all the statistics for how many background check denials there are in a given month. And typically, there are about 220 of them. Now, they don't provide details on how many people are delayed, which is far more common and almost always unjustified. But if a person is denied a firearms transfer, why are they denied? Well, they're denied for one of a couple of reasons, according to the state police. They have mental health issues, which makes it illegal for them to buy a gun. They're felons, which makes it illegal to buy a gun. They're currently wanted by the police, which makes them illegal to buy a gun. The other category is, is that the police believe the gun in question has been, was stolen. And in most cases, they're just wrong about that. OK, so average month, 220 people are told they can't complete the transfer. Average number of arrests of felons who attempt firearms transfers. That's a, that's a felony to do that, right? Average number of arrests, anyone want to guess? Zero. Zero, all right? So day after day after day, 
people who are prohibited from buying guns walk into gun stores, attempt to purchase, or at least the state police claim that they're prohibited, and then a cop is sent to that. Oregon State Police officer is taken off the road, sometimes for three or four hours if they're out in a, a rural part of the state. They walk into the, the building, they walk into the gun store, and if the person's still there and they try to keep them there by lying about this, they say, I've had one case, a gun store in Milwaukee. Had somebody come in, he was de denied, State trooper rolled in an hour later and said to him, you can't have this gun because there's an outstanding warrant for your arrest. Have a nice day, and walked out. So what is the exact purpose of this? Since we're, we're not actually, we hear the statistics from the anti-gun people. The Brady Bill stopped two million people from buying guns. No, it didn't. It stopped one person from getting that gun in that place, and then he walked out the door and got it someplace else. So what it is, it's theater. It's really not intended. There's no liability for genuinely prohibited people, but if you're a legitimate person, and God forbid you're a legitimate person who's in fear for their life, and now you're told, wait 60, 90 days. I mean, there's a gun, store, a gun store in Portland. I spoke to the owner a few days ago. He has 200 guns waiting there for the police to transfer them. Why? They claim they do this great job. But if they don't do a good job, then it becomes your problem. They have no liability. There's no responsibility if they get it wrong. And time after time, when people call me and say, I've been delayed, I don't know what to do, and they won't return my calls. They're not interested, they won't tell me what's going on. It's like the old phone company. I say, what, what district do you live in? And if you live in a Republican district and a legislator calls the state police, the problem's solved in a half an hour, sometimes less. So the whole thing is, is it's feel good, but it actually has accomplished nothing. Chris Leslie, former member, thank you, Kevin, for being here. This is a very hot topic, as we say. Uh, the idea of armed guards in schools, how do you stand on that? Listen, I spent a lot of time in the Capitol in Salem, all right? Who's in the Capitol? Legislators and lobbyists, people like me. The place is wall-to-wall -wall cops. They've got uniforms, they've got plainclothes cops. We, meaning the lobby and the legislators, are the best protected people in this state. School kids get nothing. I think that's outrageous. I think that if we really cared as much about kids as we say we did, we'd recognize that as rare as it is, these incidents happen, and we provide protection for them at least at the level that we do for legislators and lobbyists. Now, there's a fiscal issue here, obviously, since a third of the state police are sitting down in the Capitol and they're not out protecting schools. There will be schools that simply say they cannot afford to do this. But I believe that in virtually every school district, there are people living in that district who are retired police officers, who are retired military, who are competent, intelligent people who could volunteer their time, or school staff. You know, we, we all talk about what heroes our, our teachers are, and yet we consider them utterly incompetent to protect children under their mantle of care. Do you know how many children have died in school fires in this country in the last 50 years? Anybody know? None. Why? Why is that? It's because we recognize the potential for fire, and we teach people how to respond to it, and we give them tools to respond to it, and we allow teachers to learn things like how to handle a fire extinguisher, how to get kids out of the room, that kind of thing. And yet, we entrust them with the education of our kids, but we insist that they're utterly incapable of doing something that every 20-year-old cop learns to do at the academy. So yes, I think that it's outrageous that we protect legislators more than we protect, protect school children. Harry Bodine, forum member. We have very good friends up in Alberta, rural Alberta, and uh, they own four rifles which are kept in a gun case in the, their master bedroom. And whenever those guns leave that case, especially if they go on board a, a Cessna that these people own, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are notified that that rifle is, is on that aircraft headed for a specific location and it'll be up the time zone, it'll be there. How long is it going to be up there? The reason is if, they, if you're fishing and you encounter a bear, you want to be able to take care of the bear. My question is this. The Canadians do not have the Bill of Rights on, on, on guns. They have a homicide rate that is about 10% of what the United States of America has. And so they, they have more regulations, but why is their system not apply applicable here with the results that they have, which are much better than ours. 
Well, first of all, I take issue with the idea that first, I, I'm not buying that their homicide rate is, is uh, one-tenth of ours, but the, the fact is, is that a number of years ago, the Canadian government instituted this massive registration system of all long guns. So most guns, a lot of guns there you can't own at all, very difficult to own handguns, but the hunting rifles were all heavily regulated and they instituted a massive registration scheme, which was a complete failure, which they have thrown away now. It cost them several billion dollars and the compliance rate was so low that they recognized it was a joke. But you bring up a very interesting point, and a point that was brought up but the, when the anti-gun person was here, he, he made some points about, you know, societal influences. Why is it different in Canada? Well, you're right. They don't have a Bill of Rights. They don't have a constitution like ours. They don't have an articulated individual liberties, which is a bedrock uh, foundation of, of American government. But why do we have the violence we have? Well, the fact is, there's no violence here, right? There's no violence at my gun club where there are hundreds of people with guns. Why is that? Where is the violence? Well, the violence is in inner city Chicago and New Orleans. It is a cultural problem. It is not a problem. If you, if you take out several big cities in this country, our gun violence rate is significantly lower than most of the rest of the, the um, industrialized world. The fact is, is we, the, um, instant, the examples were brought up by, by uh, your, your anti-gun person about how difficult it is to get a gun in Germany. Well, guess what? Right now in Germany and other parts of Europe, their cultures are changing very rapidly. There are people moving in there who are not European, people who don't have the same regard for, for people's sanctity, people who think that rape is a sport. And now what's happening is people in Germany are, are buying guns at an just unprecedented rate because they have an influx of a culture that doesn't have any respect for other people's safety or liberty. And I think you see that in Canada, where you simply have a different, you dif have a different culture. You don't have the same number of, of, of people who've been generation after generation in welfare states. What's the difference between a 16-year-old or a 15-year-old at a shotgun at my gun club or a 15-year-old who's shooting somebody in a gang incident in Portland? Well, parents, for one, you know? The fact that there is a dad around. And listen, I was coming in today, I was listening to the news, Last night in New Orleans, there were four stabbings, all right? Had one of the highest uh, crime rates anywhere in the country, four stabbings, all right? Had nothing to do with gun control. Why is it? It's because there are certain, look, hip hop culture, it, it encourages the murder of police officers. It denigrates women, you know? Hoes and bitches, that's what women are. That is a cultural issue that has nothing to do with firearms that has to be addressed, and that's why we have a different culture than they have in Canada. <coughs> Sir. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. I'm curious about the concept of the 3D manufacturing of weapons. I understand that people can make a plastic gun at home and wondered if, if that is the case. And number two, well, if, if, if it is the case, uh, is that a weapon that uh, should be regulated in some fashion or if your organization has taken a position on those? Well. L listen, 3D printing is nothing new. It's, what's new is that there are now cheaper machines that can do it and do it in plastic. We've had computer-controlled machining for a long time. So it, we've always had the ability for an individual to make a gun. And in fact, uh, pe people can make guns relatively easily. The guns that you're referring to, it's, it's very, very difficult to make a functioning firearm out of plastic because of the simple physics of it, all right? I have seen one firearm that could function that was made out of plastic that could fire one round. Couldn't find it. I have no doubts that that'll change. That technology will change to to extent, as it always does, that it will become easier for people to do that. But ultimately, it's always been possible. There's always been ways to do it. Guys make guns in prisons. There's an exhibit in the, in the Capitol a couple of years ago about several fire, firearms that were manufactured in prison by, by uh, prisoners. So given that I don't believe that the state has a right to regulate your individual liberties, I would be, I'm much more concerned about people's behavior than I am about their possessions. You know, we hear about you shouldn't have a magazine that can hold more than this many bullets, or why does a person need this kind of gun, or why do you have a safe full of guns? Well, my safe full of guns doesn't hurt anybody, so I'm not concerned about people's possessions. The guns that they're manufacturing with 3D plastic printers are the least of our concerns at, the, at this time. They're just terribly inefficient. If someday they are, we'll be dealing with them just like we're dealing with the illicit guns that are on the streets now. 
I have two questions. Um, first, you keep talking. Oh, I'm Kate Arnold. I'm a new member. I just paid. <laughs> So two questions. You keep talking about people using guns to defend themselves. I don't know if the statistics have changed, but some years ago I heard about this. There was a movement by emergency room nurses who were tired of seeing people come in shot, so they made a movement to try to change some of the laws. But the statistics that were quoted were that 61% of deaths were suicide. Over a third of the other deaths were people that, who were shooting people they knew. And then there's less than 10%. And that also, you had a greater, oper uh, greater likelihood of being shot with your own weapon than actually shooting the person who you're supposedly defending yourself. Have those statistics changed? And yeah. Oh, yeah, they've changed because they were invented to begin with, and they've changed constantly. Um, that, the statistic about having a gun used against you started off about 25 years ago and has grown exponentially year after year, when now it is 47% more likely that a gun in your home will be used against you. It's been completely debunked, as have the, the uh, accusations that concealed license holders are committing murders everywhere. When you start looking at those statistics, and you can find all this online, those statistics are invented. As a matter of fact, this past, uh, last, last year when we had the 941 effort, I was constantly being asked by Republican leadership to provide them with statistics that proved that the other side was wrong. And it was a fool's errand because the statistics were being invented on a daily basis, backed up by nothing more than studies that they claimed they had done themselves. Um, one of the statistics is, is that you are far more likely, and th this is true, you are far more likely to be shot if there's a gun in your house. Well, yes, you are far more likely to be shot if there's a gun in your house because without a gun you can't be shot. The other statistic we heard recently, which I found astonishing is that in states that have universal background checks, there are 40% fewer police officers shot. The statistic is utterly meaningless. 40% less than what? 40% less than the state next door? 40% less than the state before background checks? In Oregon, on a typical year, no cops are, are shot and killed. So what's 40% less than zero? So what I would suggest is that instead of looking at statistics, which mean very little, which I can make up my statistics just like they can make up theirs, Let's look at the reality of the situation, is that, first of all, uh, Ceasefire Oregon themselves say that 80% of gun deaths in this, in this state are, are uh, suicides, right? That is a problem that is devastating, but it is not a problem of criminal gun violence. We talked 400 people were shot last year in Oregon. That's what you were told by your guest two months ago, okay? 80% of those people were homicides, uh, suicides, rather. So how do we justify that with the, the idea that We've got this epidemic, and also, how do you determine when a gun was used successfully in a defensive situation when in the overwhelming majority of those cases, no shots are fired? A gun is drawn, the situation is diffused, and people leave. Those statistics don't quite make it to the Oregonian. So are you saying there's no statistics that you think are credible for gun violence? I'm saying that I'm very skeptical of statistics that are generated by people like Michael Bloomberg and Every Town for Gun Safety. And I think there are a lot of statistics that are not kept accurately because they can't be kept accurately. You don't know how many times a gun was used in a self-defense situation unless somebody's been shot or arrested. If a, a gun is drawn, I've had that experience myself. I was invited to KATU years ago, all right? In the, in the, when, I, when I left the studio, about 50 people swarmed, told me they were going to kill me, and attack me. I drew a firearm, they all went away. Did you read about that? Did you read about that successful use of a defensive firearm? Of course not. But that's how most of them go. That's why the statistics are not terribly meaningful. Yes, sir. Chris. Yes, thank you, Kevin. You're very articulate, and it's very good information. I wondered what about uh, teachers being armed in schools? Well, obviously, I support that. Uh, our, there are many instructors in this state. I am one of them. Our gun club is one of them that has offered free training to school personnel. I think that you simply can't guarantee, you know, you, you got out to Eastern Oregon maybe two hours before a cop can get there. And I'm, I was always kind of surprised when I hear groups like teachers unions so opposition in, in to this because Obviously, you know, their position is, is that teachers are great, competent folks. And I think that if they're great and competent, look, 
Um, we all know what happened in Connecticut, where those students and those teachers were gunned down like caged animals, right? I, for the life of me, cannot imagine that, that one of those teachers, one of those, one of those women who was huddled in a closet trying to protect those babies, knowing that somebody was walking, shooting them like fish in a barrel, I do not believe that she ever had the thought, thank God I don't have a gun. I just don't believe it. Now, I made this point at a, a city club a debate one time, and ceasefire Oregon representative said I was mocking teachers. What a ridiculous thing to say. I was saying we've seen this, we've seen this in, in, uh, in Colorado, we've seen this in many, many places where had a person not been prohibited from protecting themselves, is it a guarantee? Of course not. It's not a magic talisman. Police officers who are armed and trained get killed. As a matter of fact, the, this is the one instance of gun violence that's actually on the rise, that police officers getting killed, you know, in direct proportion to the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. Right? The fact is, is that giving somebody an opportunity to protect themselves is far better than just saying, look, you're on your own and you wait till the police arrive. That's how people die. Do you think there's a good, that, that it's okay for people to have machine guns and things that, it, should we ever put any limits and why should it be okay for people to have those kinds of weapons when they're... So deadly. How, can, maybe um, I have to ask a question. I don't know if I have to pay for that, but um, if you can explain to me how a machine gun is more deadly than the rifles I have, I would love to hear why. Well, if, if your rifle can shoot 100, well, I don't know enough about guns, but I know you can shoot at, at many, many shots in a row, da -da 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 -da, or at least that's what I've always understood that assault, some of the weapons can do. If your rifle can shoot that many, then I'm wondering why? Why should? Why do we give someone such a lethal weapon? Uh, can you give me an example of any firearm that's not lethal, and why would you allow those? Say that again. You, you said why would you give, give somebody such a lethal weapon? Well, all weapons are lethal. All firearms are capable of being lethal. All firearms originated as military firearms. If you're opposed to lethality, why allow a person to have any firearm? That's not, that's not the issue. The issue isn't whether you can kill someone, it's how many shots you can fire at people. And I, I have no problem with people using guns to hunt and things like that. Um, I do believe the statistic that you're, you're more likely to be shot than shoot than get a person. That when I read the newspaper, I, when I hear about domestic abuse, I can't, you know, the number of times I've heard of people defending themselves and shooting someone versus being shot by the angry person that's a, coming in towards them, it seems to be way weighted towards the side of the abuser being the one who successfully shoots someone rather than the defender. So my concern about weapons that can shoot lots and lots of bullets is it gives people lots and lots more opportunity to do me deadly things. So if I can shoot one bullet and kill someone versus shoot 100 at people, that is a different thing to me. Well, as you pointed out, you don't know anything about, don't know much about firearms, and the fact is, is that um, most firearms are capable, uh, or many firearms are capable of shooting many, many rounds very quickly. In fact, machine guns are legal in this country. Uh, they were heavily regulated in 1934, but they still are legal. They're rare because they're because of the regulations. They're very, very expensive. But if you've if you've dealt, if you've ever experienced, which apparently you haven't. Um, a modern semi-automatic firearm, which most are, their ability to, to shoot rapidly, they, they have that ability. And a machine gun's ability to do it isn't really that much different. Um, the, what you have to do to get a machine gun in this country, if you can find one, is pay a very high tax stamp to the IRS. But it's almost like the position of people who are opposed to certain firearms is, is that this gun can kill you deader than this gun. And any, any firearm can kill you, a hunting rifle can kill you. In fact, hunting rifle cartridges are typically much more powerful than the average cartridge that a pistol holds or that even the dreaded AR-15 holds. So I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to say, we're gonna allow you to own this firearm, but we're gonna prevent you from owning that firearm, when in fact, if you look at the history of Supreme Court decisions up to Heller, which I think in Heller got it m very wrong, um, the Supreme Court has, has has said unequivocally that the only firearms that are protected constitutionally are military firearms, which means that, in fact, machine guns should be far more available to the public because that is typically the type of firearm that our 
that our military has, or, or firearm that's capable of firing fully automatically. And so that's what's protected. If you think that a person, listen, that we've had a number of instances, the Navy Yard shooting, that was all done with a shotgun, the very gun that Joe Biden has recommended that people like you get and shoot through their door, all right? Guns are capable of being lethal, as are baseball bats and automobiles and fists and feet. All right, thank you very much. Um, my question, you're talking about things being lethal and people defending themselves. Why not use less lethal methods like tasers, beanbags, mace, those are ways to help defend yourself, and they're less lethal than a gun. Why not use those methods instead of having a gun? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, you can't use those against somebody unless they are in close proximity, they're not wearing heavy clothing, and they haven't been maced in the past. A uh, police chief of my town, who was a former Portland police officer, will tell you that he's, he's completely unaffected by pepper spray, because in training it's happened to him so many times it doesn't have any effect on him. This is true of people who've been, I mean, listen, you see over and over again people being tased, there's absolutely no reaction at all. Plus, you have to be in very close proximity. Bean bags are really not a, a, reasonable, a reasonable kind of alternative because they're really only available to be fired out of shotguns, which you really can't comfortably carry. But the fact is, is that if you are being, if you're being attacked, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you had to defend yourself against me and I'm just throwing punches at you, you're going to be able to take care of that with your hands and your feet, right? What if there's eight and nine of my buddies, eight or nine of those guys, and we all have baseball bats? Do you want to try and respond to us with a taser? I mean, you get one shot with a taser. So it just really isn't practical. Okay. Are we done? Slide. Sure, somehow. Thank you very much, Kevin. Really appreciate it. I'll get back to that in just a second, but thank you, Kevin. Really. Folks, two things. Next week, same time, same station, we have the three uh, candidates for the Democratic nomination for the Secretary of State. You know, we're in an election season. And following that, the following week, we have, uh, well, three to five. I'm not sure how many of the five candidates, but at least three are committed. Those folks seeking the Republican nomination for governor will be here. What I wanted to say in addition to a, another thank you to Kevin is thank you for giving me the opportunity to be really proud of the folks in this room. There's a majority in this room who did not, in my opinion, in my judgment, agree with the general attitude of the speaker today. The speaker, again, showed courage, I think, in coming here based on his remembrance of his previous experience, and I very much respect that. But what I respect even more than that is the courtesy and respect that this group has shown somebody that they disagree with. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.